So yeah, I'm Bruce and I'm an extreme alcoholic. Uh, this is actually a brand of clothing in Japan. And when I was doing a talk in Tokyo a few years ago, M Mike from the W3C said, we've got to go into this shopping mall. I was like, why? I don't do shopping. And I saw this and I lay in front of it until the security guards told me to fuck off. <laughs> so um, <coughs> anyway, I'm Bruce. And before I start, I want to say thank you to Dave, Janestra, Chris and Alana for putting on this event. They do it for free. It's a labor of love. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> so first off, I'm Bruce and I currently do accessibility for Babylon Health with a woman called Stinky Taylor. Make yourself known, Stinky. Give us a wave. She was over there. Um, <laughs> the famous Stinky Taylor, but I have to say that nothing in this is any way indicative of the company. It's all my own stuff. Um, they want me to tell you that. So history, Mark Twain said, is written by the winners. Um, those of you who are seriously geriatric, I'm looking at you, Dave, I'm looking at you, Jeremy Keith, I'm looking at you, Emmy Sharp, and I'm looking at myself and shaking my head sadly. Um, those of us who are really old will remember Internet Explorer, uh, particularly Internet Explorer 6, um, which held back our industry for well over a half a decade. Um, <coughs> and those of you who are less geriatric might have heard of it, and you'll have heard from old farts like myself that we developers got together and uh, campaigned against Internet Explorer um, because it murdered Netscape, which was deeply wonderful. And everything's great because of what we did. Uh, yeah, we campaigned for Firefox and against IE, and we won. But <coughs> we did win, but history is not actually as simple as that. So the lady taking photos, I'm going to publish a link to the slide so you can... Grab it later. That's <laughs> yeah, true. So the idea that we campaigned and we won, this is actually uh, fake news. <laughs> uh, <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's more of this. Uh, <laughs> when Dave said that I was showing him weird things on my phone, it wasn't like weird, weird stuff. Uh, <coughs> Because I don't have the ability to draw nice pictures, I got stable diffusion, um, <coughs> which is an, a brilliant open source AI text to images. Um, and I typed in, I think I typed in imitation GNU's made out of string and wood and old car parts. <laughs> and and it, it did some of these. And later on, I will publish on Twitter some of the outtakes. <laughs> some of the some of the deeply weird shit, like uh, I typed in enormous woolly mammoths buttocks, and you will be really surprised at what came out. Um, <coughs> so what did you do in the browser wars? <laughs> Let's look back. In October 1998, Netscape Navigator was the shit. Um, it was shit. Right? It was terrible. And so those of us, I don't know if you remember the Web Standards Project, it was an organization started by Zeldman and Meyer uh, and other people. I was briefly a member. We said, two years ago, Netscape, when your market share was still high as a kite, you pledged to fully support five key standards in the next version of your browser. At last, you were talking about shipping product by the end of the year. Sounds great, except it's the wrong year. Continuing to periodically upgrade your browser while failing to address its basic flaws has made it appear that you still consider Netscape to be a viable browser. It is not. Keeping your 4.0 browser on the market has forced developer to developers to continue writing bad code in order to support it. If you fail now, the web will essentially belong to a single company. And for once, nobody will be able to blame them for competing unfairly. So please, for your own good and for the good of the web, develop, deliver on your promises 
while Netscape 6 still has a chance to make a difference. Netscape 4 was so terrible that they decided to rewrite the entire code base and it took ages. The code name for the new code base was called Mozilla. Um, and so they skipped version 5 and released version 6. And this <laughs> is what Stable Diffusion <laughs> made of Netscape 6. Okay, it was, <laughs> it was a disaster. <clears throat> First public builds two years later were disappointing. Um, PCs at the time couldn't really run it. Uh, it was too unstable, and by this point, Netscape 6 was facing competition from IE6, released in 2001. We loved it. Let nobody tell you that we hated Internet Explorer 6. It was IETL mania, okay? St Stable Diffusion didn't make this, I did this with my legendary, <laughs> legendary Photoshop skills. Internet Explorer 6 shows great promise. It's actually really hard 21 years later to find quotes from the time because of link rot, but this is just a few. Internet Explorer offers few quirks and many superb features. After introducing IE-only layout features such as scrolling marquees and coloured table borders, Microsoft is now committed to the standards set by the World Wide Web Consortium. That's what we said. The Web Standards Project said IE6 for Windows delivers fine support for HTML4, CSS and other important W3C standards. A punter said, I love this browser. I've loved browsing the web since I started way back in the mid-90s and I really love browsing with IE, said Scott Stearns, a test manager <laughs> for, for IE. We loved it. We loved dock type switching for the broken box model. And now, apparently, to the, uh, according to the HTTP um, archive, apparently nearly every website uh, out there uses the pre-IE6 box model. We loved HTML components, so much so that we're reinventing them at the moment. We loved CSS expressions, so much so that we've recently reinvented them. We love page transitions, and if Jake Archibald wasn't such a big wuss, <laughs> he would be here now telling us about how he's reinvented them. We loved IE filters and DHTML behavior, so much so that we're reinventing them. We love data binding and saving states, so much so that we use massive, great big JavaScript frameworks to reinvent them. Yep. It had bugs. <laughs> Thank you, Stable Diffusion, for <laughs> cute bugs. Uh, yeah, I mean, these became our old mates. Whole websites were devoted to telling us about the peekaboo bug, the IE three pixel text jog. I'm, this is not. I'm not lying. These are actual things. <laughs> <coughs> we. We invented clever workarounds for these with some voodoo CSS, like this. Basically, if something didn't work in IE, you stuck this on it and it just magically worked. Nobody, <laughs> to this day, nobody knows how it happens, but it is black magic. We loved it so much that we prioritized developer experience over user experience. Can you imagine people doing that? <laughs> we would say, Click here to download Internet Explorer because it's best in that. We, we, as an industry, perpetuated the IE monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say thank you to my upside down friend for that. Uh, Microsoft decided to tightly couple new IE releases with the operating system. Can you imagine an organization only <laughs> releasing a new browser when it released a new operating system? Ugh, completely impossible these days. So they dismantled the IE team and rolled them into the Windows team. But Windows Vista was hugely delayed, which meant IE was hugely delayed. 
there was nobody in Microsoft upgrading Internet Explorer 6. And it was so dodgy that Google were paying people if you downloaded Firefox with a Google plugin from their site. And if, I don't know if you ever have AdSense, but a dollar is big, big money in the ad world. The US government warned people of security vulnerabilities, which made lots of organizations download Firefox. The community crowdfunded a full page ad in the New York Times and loads of people downloaded Firefox. And weirdly, <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not saying correlation <laughs> is causation, but you know, look at the numbers, as the government would say. And everything was lovely in Web Standards Land. Web Standards Land and Browser World are not yet theme parks, but if anybody knows a venture capitalist, I've got some really great ideas <laughs> for, for a web standards-based roller coaster. Uh, thank you again to Stable Diffusion for this. I think the curly braces on CSS's head are a particularly great touch, actually. <laughs> but everything was not rosy. There was a but, a very big but, and that was why I was looking for mammoth buttocks, but it didn't work out, so. <laughs> and as a code of conduct. Um, <laughs> behind the scenes in web standards land, a terrifying figure stalked the night. Yes, I'm talking <laughs> about Safari. 10 years ago, 11 years ago actually, if I could do maths, PPK, the mighty PPK, asked the community, do you hope that WebKit, which is the rendering engine inside Safari, will become the only rendering engines and the others will die? And in our community, 33% of people went, yep, yep, oh, that was a really good idea. Because pesky users using operating systems or devices that you don't use do not deserve to see your websites. Apple, like Microsoft, was sleeping. Uh, this came out in the Epic court case last year. Eddie Q, who reports directly to Tim Cook, wrote in 2013, the reason we lost Safari on Windows is the same reason we're losing Safari on the Mac. We didn't innovate or enhance Safari. We had an amazing start, and then we stopped innovating. Look at Chrome. They put out releases at least once a month, and basically we do it once a year. And this is why... Rather than innovate, Apple just do not let you, on iOS or iPad, use any other browser. So we can't do progressive web apps properly, which are websites plus plus. You can save them to the home screen. Actually, everybody here knows this shit. Um, <laughs> you can't do them properly on Safari on iOS because Safari doesn't allow push notifications. Yes, you can have push notifications on iOS, but only in native apps. <coughs> you can't save stuff to the home screen properly. Well, you can in Safari on iOS. Even Firefox on iOS, you can't save stuff to the home screen. So whereas Apple always said there's an app for that, Microsoft, uh, Firefox and Chrome have said there's an API for that. You, you can do this with an API, there's loads of, you know, there's push notifications, there's geolocation, there's web Bluetooth, you know them. Here's the APIs for progressive web apps and Chrome for Android. Here's the APIs for progressive web apps in Safari on iOS. And progressive web apps are the future. I used to work for Opera and I did lots of work in India, Indonesia particularly, uh, Kenya, um, and uh, Uganda, and developers there love progressive web apps because they're much smaller, they're much more performant. In places where people can't afford a $1,000 uh, iPhone or play, people can't afford super connectivity or networks are clogged, progressive web apps work really well. But you can't do them because of Rule 2.5.6. 
Apple say apps that browse the web must use the appropriate WebKit framework and WebKit JavaScript, must. You cannot browse the web with anything other than WebKit. Yes, there's Firefox on iOS. Yes, there's Chrome on iOS. But they all have to use WebKit, and not just any WebKit. They can't bundle their own WebKit. They can't bundle the latest WebKit. They can only use the WebKit that Apple decides to ship. So Firefox on iPhone, Safari. Edge on iPhone, Safari. Chrome on iPhone, Safari. A lot of developers don't know this. They go, yeah, yeah, but I've downloaded Chrome. Yeah, but you're still using WebKit. Um, <coughs> and WebKit is so buggy that Christmas last, there was a bug with indexed DB, uh, a cross-origin bug, which meant that any malicious website could see the indexed DB from any other website. And this bug, from reporting it to being fixed and the fix shipping of people's browsers, took 57 days. So for 57 days, your browser history was leaking. And we couldn't tell people, don't surf the web with Safari, use Chrome or Firefox, because that also was compelled to use WebKit. So for 57 days, if you have an iPhone, you were, your browser history was leaking. And of course, nobody here looks at dodgy shit, but some people do. The patch gap. By far, WebKit takes the longest from a patch landing in web, sorry, Safari takes the longest by far from a patch landing in the WebKit project to its shipping to actual punters. By far, Safari has the longest patch gap. We asked by, uh, Apple, we begged, we cajoled. I even, you know, like wrote a letter to Tim Cook and he didn't even reply. Um, and we realized that the only way to get Apple to play nicely was regulation. So a group of four of us, Stuart Langridge, flaxen-haired Foss of Donus, and myself with my winter beard, <coughs> and two other developers, British developers, who are so scared of Apple because Apple basically controls their entire business, they're so scared of them they have to remain anonymous because Apple has history of just throwing people's apps out of the app store if they don't like them. And these guys run a business with lots of employees. So we decided to contact the regulators. We started a group called Open Web Advocacy. It's not really an organization. It's just like a few people and people who agree. Our top three of priorities were ending the Apple browser ban allowing web apps to have the same integration with the device as native apps do, with permissions, of course, but you know, putting an end to the fact that native apps can put, do push notifications, but web can't. And <coughs> all artificial barriers placed by gatekeepers must be removed, we said. And the, the CMA, the Competition and Markets Authority, weirdly, contacted us and said, would you come and brief us? <coughs> it's a UK government organisation, so I fully expected it to be full of you know, old judges wearing wigs going, well, what is a web browser? <laughs> <coughs> but it wasn't. It was lawyers and ec 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 economists, but they really understood what was going on. They were really cool. So actually, I thought their logo was really boring, so... I've designed them a new one. They're welcome to have it. <laughs> this isn't stable diffusion. I fucking made this. Uh, <coughs> but they're really, really cool. And they opened a market investigation into mobile browsers. One of the things that they didn't realize was the difference between a browser and a rendering engine. They hadn't understood, like many web developers don't, that just because it's called Firefox doesn't on iOS doesn't mean it's got a gecko inside it. They hadn't belly felt the fact that on iOS, all the browsers are basically branded skins over WebKit. <coughs> but I'm very glad that in their report, they got this. So they've said, browsers are powered by an engine. 
Apple bans alternatives to its own browser engine on its mobile devices, a restriction that is unique to Apple. The CMA is concerned this severely limits the potential for rival browsers to differentiate themselves from Safari and limits Apple's incentives to invest in its browser engine. This restriction also seriously inhibits the capability of web apps, depriving consumers and businesses of the full benefits of this innovative technology. And, and the CMA have started up uh, uh, an internal organization called the DMU, the Digital Markets Unit. And this will get statutory powers to investigate <coughs> and to fine <coughs> people who are naughty. Uh, th this happens all the time. Um, for example, all the supermarkets, there is a grocery code advocate who deals with um, su supermarkets taking the piss out of suppliers and it has powers to fine. <coughs> but if this has to become uh, to be legislated for, uh, last year in the Queen's speech, God bless her, um, <coughs> the government announced that it was going to give powers to the DMU, but nothing's happened and it's, it's almost like our government is a bit of a chaotic mess at the moment. <laughs> <coughs> um, so, <coughs> massive Marxist and radical feminist MP Jess Phillips, <laughs> she asked a question um, last two weeks ago of the Digital Culture and Media Sport Ministry asking when are you going to give powers to the DMU? Who knew that a radical Marxist and feminist cared about web standards? I wonder where she got the information from. <laughs> uh, God bless her, her office is literally across the road from my house. Um, I bribed her with my missus's uh, Thai green curry and a bottle of Peroni. Uh, <coughs> I shit you not. Um, the government wrote back and went, yeah, yeah, it'll be published as soon as parliamentary time allows. <laughs> so she's going to ask uh, an oral question in the Commons about this. But it will come, because it's not contentious. You know, this is a, a Tory legislation introduced by uh, such intellectual giants as Nadine Doris and uh, <laughs> Kwasi Kwarteng and uh, Labour MPs asking about it, it's, it's going to pass. It just has to get time in the Commons. Meanwhile, the EU contacted the four of us and asked us to brief them. And they were writing the DMA, the Digital Markets Act. Um, <coughs> again, this is what it looks like. It's really boring, so I've made a logo for them. <laughs> this is... <laughs> look at that. Yeah? yeah, look at that. I'm selling shirts like this, if you want. Um, <laughs> And the DMA came into force two weeks ago. It's not being applied yet in order to give organisations a chance actually to make any necessary changes, but this is law as of two weeks ago. And the law says gatekeepers can no longer rank their own products or services higher. Uh, they can no longer reuse private data. They can no longer establish unfair conditions for business users. They can no longer pre-install certain software applications. And they can no longer require app developers to use certain services. And after we briefed them, they understood about a browser engine. So the DMA, the law in the EU, uh, the UK is not in the EU anymore, in case you haven't noticed. Um, <laughs> The law says each browser is built on a web browser engine and gatekeepers operate and impose web browser engines in a position to determine the functionality and standards that will apply not only to their own web browsers but also to competing web browsers and in turn to web software applications. Gatekeepers should therefore not use their position to require dependent business users to uh, use any of the services. Gatekeepers should be prohibited from requiring end users to use such services. And this act has big teeth. Thank you, Stable Diffusion. If a gatekeeper violates the rules, it risks a fine of 10% of its total worldwide turnover. For a repeat offence, a fine of up to 20%. This is the law now. It will be applied probably in the middle of 2023. They're giving, you know, you, we all know that it takes six months to 
change a typo on a website, or it does if you work in a big organization. So given they're due, they're giving browser, uh, they're giving software vendors time to make the necessary changes, but this is the law now. Um, also, next week, um, the Japanese government have asked us to brief them and the press, which is cool. So if you see like photographs of me looking glam in Japanese newspapers, this is why. <laughs> um, weirdly, right, weirdly, highly paid employees of Apple who are paid to evangelize Safari are a little bit sad about this, a little bit sad, actually. Uh, gosh, catching up with tech Twitter this morning, and there seems to be an angry pocket of men who really want Safari to go away. Do we really want to live in a 95% Chromium browser world? It would be a horrible future for the web. We need more voices, not fewer. I completely agree. We need more voices, not fewer, including on iOS and including on iPad. I do not want a Chromium monopoly. Firefox, God bless them, Firefox seems to have kind of given up the fight. It's woken up a little bit since these legislation came about, but the only people, in my opinion, who give Chrome a run for their money are Apple. Apple have hugely loyal Hugely loyal customers. I mean, I'm using a MacBook Pro that costs basically as much as my house. <laughs> they have huge brand loyalty, huge brand recognition, uh, quite a lot of money in the bank, and a massive marketing budget. Apple are the only people who can compete with Google. So I want them to set Safari free. WebKit, the rendering engine, can run on Android. It can run on Windows. It used to run on Windows. It can run on Linux. Apple could, if it chose, make Safari a fabulous cross-platform browser to compete with Chrome. But it's chosen not to. I don't know why. Now, those of you who know me, know that I'm really, really into music, and, and I, I, I see the world through the, the prism of music. Um, by the way, I've just released an album. You should, you should buy it. It's two quid, <laughs> bruce-lawson.bandcamp.com. Great people have said fabulous things about it, so, uh, you know. <laughs> Get it. Anyway, so, that's the URL, bruce-lawson.bandcamp.com. Anyway, so I think a lot about music. So Jim Morrison, what a guy. He died aged 27, but what a legacy he left. Amy Winehouse, she died aged 27, and what a legacy she left. Kurt Cobain, he died aged 27. What a legacy he left. Jimi Hendrix died aged 27, and what a legacy he left. Internet Explorer died. Age 27. <laughs> Let its legacy be that we developers will no longer tolerate browser monopolies, no longer perpetuate browser monopolies, and let its legacy be that we developers will commit to maintaining and developing for an open, accessible web for everybody. Thanks and snogs.